television highlights of the news of yesteryear. It's July 1933, and in early dawn at Floyd Bennett Field, New York, Wiley Post nudges the heavily laden Winnie Mae skyward and noses his plane toward Europe. Rovet pilot doesn't work, but Post still takes plane nonstop to Berlin for new long-range record for one-hop flight, and he's just 25 hours and few minutes from New York. Quick to recognize Post's heroic and mark-smashing deed, Germans almost crush the Winnie Mae as they crowd in to cheer and get a close look at America's famous one-eyed flyer. But this is just Wiley's first stop on an intended round-the-world tour. Post's momentous feat wins even the admiration of some of Adolf Hitler's costumed cronies. Here, Post takes a well-deserved rest as his plane takes on fuel for next long leap. This time, Moscow is the Winnie Mae's destination. Poor visibility forces Wiley back for 12-hour delay. But next day, Post is off again on round-the-world journey of long leaps to Moscow, Moscow to Siberia, Siberia to Canada, and then from Canada in a last long leg to Floyd Bennett Field again. Close to midnight, Crowds jam the field and searchlights pierce the moonless sky. An anxious Mrs. Post says, That looks like his ship now. I hope it is. And the prayers of Mrs. Post are answered. It's Wiley's plane, all right. The famed ace has flown round the world in one week. The Winnie Mae is a wonder plane. And while still in cockpit, Post radios to his parents. Oh, I'm very tired. Is <laughs> that all you can say to your father and mother if you've been away a week? A long weekend? The flight's over, but the shouting isn't. Nor are the honors that are due this dauntless pioneer of the air. Day after end of epic journey around the world, Post begins brief but less lonesome trip up New York's Broadway. And if visibility is poor, it's because of ticker tape and confetti that showers down on America's airman hero of 1933. The procession ends at steps of historic City Hall, and in place of recently resigned Jimmy Walker, New York's Mayor O'Brien honors Post, who modestly whispers his thanks. Mr. Mayor, I appreciate very much the John Falls of the city of New York. How is this? Thank you very much. In nation's capital, another famous American acknowledges Post's achievement by I saying... I thought that you people would like to have a chance at least to say how to do to a man who has just flown round the world. And I have Wiley Post right here beside me. With Getty, Post had flown an historic flight two years before. With Will Rogers two years hence, Wiley Post and tragedy would fly another. It's 1917, and from San Francisco, American troops set sail for Siberia to reinforce Tsarist troops fighting steadily losing civil war with Bolshevist insurgents. Even in 1917, Red Menace took armed Americans across the Pacific to fight a war. With seasoned troops goes large shipment of arms. War internal struggle in Russia and Siberia looked like long affair in 1917, though no one was betting on the Bolshevists to win. With Brother Doughboys busy with a fight in France, these fellows went off to war in the frozen wastes of Siberia. years later, same troops come home on transport Mazakaska with not much war behind them. 
Instead, they return with their Russian war brides and half-Russian children. The Reds won Russia and Siberia from the Tsar, but these Russians won happiness and the hearts of American men. Happy birthday, Herr Hindenburg. It's 1933, and in Berlin, Germany, grandchildren of former Field Marshal von Hindenburg say happy birthday number 86 to Germany's first president. The aging head of the Kaiser's defeated army spends the great day on his estate at Neudek. And here he is giving remembrances to each of the employees of his modern barony. Walking sticks with silver monogram. He marks the celebration further by joining his servants in their dining hall. Years later, he was dead, and Adolf Hitler ruled. Here in 1921 is actress Hope Hampton with her pet Mexican Chihuahua. Now there are two pets, Court and Maron by name, and by looks of things, they're jealous of each other. Well, that's what comes of falling in love with the toast of the American screen. Free soup and free show, it's 1920. And in Free Soup Kitchen in Boston, guide comedian Ben Turpin of the silent screen dishes it out two ways. He warms the non-paying customers with hot soup, then warms their hearts with a little comedy. Soup's on, and so is the entertaining Ben. It's 1921, and in New York City, hundreds are overcome by smoke and fumes from fire in subway train. Brought out of tube to safety and fresh air of streets, those not in need of immediate hospitalization are seated in long lines on sidewalks until they're able to go home. Two persons never got home from this subway accident. Trains running over elevated lines in Long Island are shrouded in fog and are telescoped by crash. Old wooden cars are nothing but matchwood now, and many are injured by the splintering effect of the accident. But lines must be cleared at once if New York's usually reliable rapid transit is to move at all. It's 10th of September, 1930, and here's Jim Sainsbury, London's most learned balancer of baskets. Pardon us, we should have said baskets. But baskets or baskets, Sainsbury sure had a load on his mind. But before he carries this any farther, let's assure you that the baskets are just empty ones. Here's Jim making with more baskets. When you get right down to it, the question really is, how many baskets can Sainsbury drop? It's 3rd of March, 1930, and here's 82-year-old Father John Hagen. Only American among 500 citizens of Pontifical State, Father Hagen is here shown in his 24th year as director of Vatican City Observatory. It's rare honor for man from across the Atlantic to be highly regarded member of the papal staff, and Father Hagen has spent nearly quarter of a century in service of the church, all at the temporal heart of the far-flung Catholic faith. Shopping in style. It's 1920, and here's the sort of thing you'd have to look at if you were a department store dummy in one of the better shops. Hey you, if you're disgusted with what you're looking at, go home and let your mirror show you what you look like to me. Interest in what the shops are showing for next year is understandable here. Stylists couldn't get out a more hodgy-podgy get-up than this. The 
hat itself isn't big enough. She's got bows in her bonnet. And the dress is velveteen. Oh, go away. If you were that dummy, wouldn't you have left your head at home a long time ago, too? Smart dummy. Here in the early 1930s, the Sonia Henney of North America shows her winning ways in New York City's Madison Square Garden. She's Miss Constance Samuel of Canada, and she's here winning her third straight North American Fancy Skating Championship, while Sonia wins even greater glory in Europe. North America's best, Miss Samuel cuts a pretty fancy figure. Never a world champion, Constance from Canada was nevertheless a constant winner in this hemisphere. And that takes in a lot of fancy skating territory. It's 31st of May, 1929, and Ray Keach is among 32 starters in annual Indianapolis Speedway Classic for racing cars. It's dry day, track is fast, so it skews our dust as 32 speed demons do everything but straighten out the turns as they blaze around Brick Oval at better than 90 miles an hour. Nice going for 1929. There are 160,000 neck craning customers in the stands, and final burst of breakneck speed shoots Ray Keach across the finish line, the winner. Coming back to his pit, Keach is $40,000 richer, but right back where he started 500 miles ago. 